streaming. Uh, Francisco, as we always connect, we give it a few minutes, you know, to make sure that all the streaming services are live. We do okay. stream to um, LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitch. We certainly have a much larger concentration on LinkedIn and uh, YouTube than the other two platforms. But um, in case everyone, anyone's uh, trying to tune in through other media, we make it available. Um, as Dave will mention, we stream this as a podcast as well. So if you're listening to uh, at a later date, it's available on a bunch of it's Google Podcasts, Spotify, Apple Podcasts. So uh, a lot of different uh, mediums. If you listen to a podcast, you can find us. Is, you're, making uh, me name, you're making me nervous, you know? <laughs> uh, I mean, so so you, you didn't even ask how many people are going to watch this live, Francisco. We'll tell you at the end. We don't want to see the, the sweat <laughs> dripping down your face. But, yeah, uh, no, no worries. <laughs> but no, so so the, the first couple of minutes, I call them community comments. Uh, we, we like to joke that this is the hardest, most talking part uh, for me. Uh, and, and I always started off by slightly embarrassing Vlad. Now, Francisco, you may or may not know Vlad has a fairly popular YouTube channel uh, that we are currently streaming on. So hey to everyone at Solus uh, PLC. It's like 23,000, almost 24,000 uh, YouTube subscribers. And, and we are on the push to get Vlad that silver play button. We want 100,000 subscribers on the channel so he can have a silver play button um, up in the, the top left corner of the of the screen. And um uh, I feel like Vlad's silver play button may be your firebrand award, but but we, we will talk about that. We, we will talk well, about that very let's shortly. Let's hope that after this podcast, uh, like if, if many Latino names start to show up in your subscribers, you know, it worked. Awesome. <laughs> Good. A absolutely. Uh, but, but so a couple of things going on in the community. Uh, so for everyone who knows uh, Preston Hadley, Preston has been on the show a couple of times. He is through the end of this month having his Change of Life giveaway. Um, with that, he's giving away Siemens S7 1500, uh, S210 servo kit, and the copy of TIA Portal V16. And as part of that, Vlad is actually going through because he's absolutely crazy. And every week he is posting a new Siemens video that, that runs for six weeks. And so that runs through the end of the month. So if you're in the continental United States or North America and would like to, to join, I have dropped the link for all of that and all of that information in, uh, in, in the LinkedIn chat. Uh, so in addition to that, um, anyone who saw Frank Lamb uh, or at the beginning of the, uh, the season or watched our episode uh, a few weeks ago with Ali G, they are doing a mastering the machine. They tip it, Frank typically does that every other Friday morning. Um, he's, they're doing it tomorrow morning. So if you guys are watching this live and want to listen to the both of them have a really good conversation, uh, you can go ahead and, uh, and do that. I, I imagine it will be a raucous conversation uh, with that. And then uh, beyond that, as you guys probably know, Copia Automation is sponsoring the DevOps and industrial automation theme. We are very happy to have them as sponsors and they are offering everyone a free trial of their modern version control um, as a free trial. So I have also dropped that as a link in the, uh, the LinkedIn chat and we will get those in the, the other chats um, in a couple of moments as well. Beyond that, as Vlad mentioned, you can find us on all the podcast places. So if you're listening on a podcast, please remember to like and subscribe and to do all of those things that we should ask on a more regular basis, but typically do not ask because, well, we're not all that great at it. Um, and you can find all of our shows on manufacturinghub.live. Uh, Vlad, before I jump into the introduction of, of Francisco, uh, more, uh, more appropriately, do you have any other thoughts or comments? No, I think you've covered it really well. I guess uh, one item to just kind of add to this, not really an announcement. Uh, those who are not aware, there's ICC going on. So the Ignition Community, um, what's the last uh, C stand Conference. for? Conference. Conference, that's right. It's, uh, it's currently going on. I believe there's still a few days left, if not a single day today. tomorrow. Today's the I last day. I think it day. ended today, yes. Um, but yeah, there's there's a cool uh, there's a few cool projects that uh, I think you can still view through the through the page, and I'm hoping that we'll get into some of those discussions with Francisco as well, because he is involved in that space uh, quite heavily. 
No, absolutely. Thank you, Vlad. And, and everyone, welcome to the Manufacturing Hub with me, Dave, and this guy over here, Vlad. We've somehow managed to make it to episode 30. Thank you for everyone other than our mothers that have watched and listened to this. Uh, we have a, a very special guest, uh, Francisco Carrion of Automation Solutions Ecuador. And as Vlad was mentioning, I feel like it's only appropriate that he comes on this week of the, the week of the Ignition Community Conference because he and I actually met at the ICC conference as panel members. I think it was it was three years ago. And so we'll absolutely talk about that. But without me blabbering on anymore, Francisco, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Vlad, for, for inviting me. No, thank you. Thank you absolutely for joining us, Francisco. And I, you know, I've alluded a little bit to your background, but I want to dig in a little bit more on how you got started in automation, manufacturing. And, you know, as we progress, like I want to learn how did you get to where you're at, which is running your own business and your own company, both like on the technical side and on the business side. So could you give us a little bit maybe background information about yourself? Sure. Well, uh, I'm uh, I'm 43 currently, <laughs> so, and I started pretty young. I started when I was uh, basically 18 years old because for for uh, for uh, uh, you know um, uh, uh, I was an exchange student in the U.S. actually, mm -hmm. and uh, and you know I was already graduated in my in my in my country when I went over there. So I took a, a, a couple of classes that you know. Uh, that interested me back at the time. You know, we're talking about the 90s, so the computers were pretty, pretty not in the manufacturing floor yet. Um, so I learned some some AutoCAD basically. And when I came back to my country, I, I had the chance to start working uh, uh, in a in a systems systems integrator uh, who needed blueprints basically. You know, someone that draws uh, the, the electrical blueprints and stuff. And coincidentally. Um, during that summer, when I came back and I and I had this summer job, uh, one of the first uh, projects for that company that involved uh, HMI uh, in software <laughs> uh, uh, came in. And and to tell you the truth, uh, it back at that time, you know, it sounds kind of silly nowadays, but uh, the the electronic engineers didn't know how to install Windows ninety five. It was a, a big challenge, basically, right? And uh, so I, I was always a little bit of a computer geek. Um, so I, I jumped into it. I started working with, uh, back at that time, I think it was it was Wonder Wayne Touch, I believe, mm -hmm. uh, version five. I think one of the earliest ones. And um, so we made that project. I really loved the, 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 the results. Uh, and I started my career, basically, in college. So I, I worked. At the same time that I was studying, um, then I, I got graduated. I kept working for this company. I worked for seven years. Uh, and then I suddenly decided that that wasn't my thing. And I switched to, to uh, an Israeli company uh, that, uh, that uh, it, it, it still does like value added platforms for, uh, uh, for, uh, cell, for cell phone companies, basically. Right. Mm -hmm. So then I discovered all the databases uh, approach and and all the communication side, and I was like, hmm, this is also interesting. So when I came, uh, I, I lasted for a couple of years in that company, and then and then I came back for uh, to uh, to to zero basically, and to say, what do I do? And I decided to start my own company, and um, and uh, along with my brother-in-law, which is my my uh, my partner nowadays. Uh, we started a company, uh, and it's been 17 years since the, since then. We have uh, we started the, the, the three of us. Um, nowadays, we're 30 people basically in the company, and uh, and uh, we were always focused on this uh, kind of uh, merging data from the from the from the uh, manufacturing floor and take it upstairs. You know, mm -hmm. they used to teach, I don't know if the US, they do that, but here in the in, in South America, they teach you the, the automation pyramid, you know, back in the in the day. And, uh, and you know, it was like like the sensors uh, and then the controllers, then the HMI. And, and it, it's funny because back, back in those days, you know, each field turned to be smaller. <laughs> like MES, which, which was like the top of the pyramid, it was the smallest portion of the pyramid. And, uh, and and nowadays, I think they should. I, I hope they have changed that, you know. And it's not uh, it, it's not like a pyramid anymore. It, it should all, or it, if it is, it should be an uh, uh, an upside down pyramid because you know the the MES and all the connection to the, the rest of the company 
it should be the, the greatest portion of it. Uh, so we were always focused on that and, and, and uh, we got a lot of know-how on, 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 on a couple of projects we did. The problem it was, you know, the, the know-how was great. The project turned out great, but we did it for a couple of multinational companies here in Ecuador. Mm -hmm. uh, and they had the budget to pay for the licensing. So it was, it was quite expensive. It was, uh, it was really, really, really heavy on the, on the, on the project budget. Mm -hmm. So we came out of these two opportunities. We were really happy with the results and we started offering, you know, doing historian, you know, plant history, mm -hmm. uh, track and trace. And uh, I'm talking uh, year 2000, basically between 2000 and 2004. And, uh, and um, you know, all, all the customers that we talked about this, they were like, that's great. That's exactly what we want. How much it costs. Mm. And we said it and they said, okay, thank you very much. <laughs> Come back when it, <laughs> when it's feasible. Right. Uh, and um, so we had to do what most integrators do, which is focus on the, on the, on the plant floor for many years, you know, doing, uh, making panels, building panels, designing, uh, uh, doing wiring. We still do, but uh, uh, but then in 2013, we started working with Ignition uh, mm -hmm. for, uh, we, just, we were presented with the, with the product and we discovered that that was the platform that actually uh, was going to allow us to, to take all this know-how that we had and we couldn't sell basically um, uh, uh, to turn this kind of projects feasible. And since then, we have been doing a lot of OE, we have been doing a lot of track and trace, have been doing a lot of um, like uh, the the I think one of the most feared things uh, on control systems is um, being able to you know interact with the ERPs and interact with with the IT level mm -hmm. uh, um, softwares and we have been doing that for almost twelve years you know so for us it's kind of like a, an everyday thing uh, and and in that sense also you know the platform that you use is uh, that it's going to be uh, really important on, on how it turns out. Uh, it was price point like the major, I guess, factor based on you know like what you saw, or was it the industry that was trying to also shift and get a lot more of that data? I'm I'm just curious, like on that perspective, right, as to why up to 2013 uh, you were focused a lot more on, on the plant floor, right, receiving those notes from the end users, and then 2013 where you've learned ignition and started to. Uh, deploy that software it made a lot more sense for them was it only price or were there other benefits that you think uh i think it's a, it's many actually it's a lot of benefits but uh, the problem is that when you don't have those benefits they all turn out on price you know mm -hmm. what i mean because for example okay let's do licensing on one side you know that's that's just a product that's 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 a price uh, in, inherent to the project but mm -hmm. the problem is that if you have a, a platform that doesn't help you as an integrator to, to uh, you actually grab and add value to, to whatever you're doing on, on it for the customer. Uh, it take, for example, something as simple as connecting to a database. Mm -hmm. You know, if you take any of the traditional SCADAs, uh, if you wanna do a, a simple insert, sometimes you have to go out to a VBA scripting. Uh, sometimes you have to go on uh, to a, some sort of, of, of C sharp, a uh, hybrid script, you know, and, uh, and, and and it takes time. So your engineering hours increase. And of course, right. the cost of the project increase and, right. and also right. the, the delivery time increase. So if you have a platform that helps you to reduce all, all that labor, you know, uh, because, uh, because it's easy uh, uh, in the sense that, that you don't have to, uh, to go into a, some kind of middleware like BBA, for example, you know, because it also takes away the, the middleman because, uh, you know, I think the three of us have, have done this. Uh, I, I saw a couple of smiles from Vlad there. So he, know, he feels the pain. <laughs> and, and every time that you go to a database and, uh, and you have like a BBA in the middle, uh, you're actually getting out of the, of the SCADA platform and getting into BBA, and then you're opening the connection to the database. So it's kind of like, you know, back in the time when, when you had like relay panels, uh, and, and one of the advantages of PLCs over relays is that you don't have so many point of error. Same, it's the same here. Uh, if, you, if you do it straight from the platform to the database, you you cut the 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 the, the possibility of a, of an error in the middle. So uh, I think you know those are some of the factors. But you know it turns out that 
every increase uh, in technology, like for example, also being able to uh, uh, deliver to the customer to you, so you can place the data wherever they want. You know, because one of the another one of the problems that we have on the on the on the platform uh, OT platforms is that you can place data only usually on 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 a on a, on a, on a specific um, uh, a, a database engine, usually MS SQL Server which is pretty good. I really like MS SQL Server, but it's not the only thing in the market. IT people and many customers, especially bigger customers, they have, they have already invested in some other, in some other um, IT platforms you know, and, and database engines, Oracle, uh, MySQL even, uh, Informix, DB2, whatever. And, 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 and it's natural that they tell you, you know, I would like to have the data, but I would have it on whatever I already invested in. And, and, and not having to create like an interface or anything like that. So there's many, many, many factors that, that actually contributed uh, starting 2013 to be able to deliver these kind of projects in a budget and, and make it happen. Absolutely. And I'd just like to point out that, you know, 2013 was eight years ago. And it's not like just South, it's not like customers everywhere else in the world other than South America were in mass adoption mode of this. I feel like there are many customers, you know, that we go into every day in 2021, eight years later, who are still not even to the point of what Francisco and his group was trying to do 12, 13 years ago before they started to hit that adoption um, back eight years ago. So I think that Francisco likes to joke, he and I, that South America and what they're doing is five years behind what North America and we are doing. I'd like to let him know that they're at least eight years ahead of many customers that I work with on most days. <laughs> That's great to hear. And, uh, and uh, yeah, and actually, uh, you know, when we met with Dave in ICC mm -hmm. four years ago, mm -hmm. uh, the first year that I went was in 2016, I believe, mm -hmm. to, to this event. And, and actually one of the best things that I, uh, I took from that event is, uh, is that feeling, you know, because mm -hmm. usually you think that this divorce between the OT and the IT happens only in Ecuador because we're a, we're a, a, a okay, I'm going to say third world country, although, you know, it, the, 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 the best uh, term should be like a, a, a developing country, I believe, or something like that. But, you know, uh, you only think that that happens here. You know, because we we don't have the the technology, we don't uh, we're or we're behind in technology and that kind of stuff. But when I went to the ICC for the first time, I could see that the same uh, pain points that we have in a, in a plant here in, in Ecuador in South America, uh, the same thing was the complaint in the in the, in, in in the US and in Canada and in Europe. You know, so it wasn't a matter of probably uh, budget. Mm -hmm. uh, it, I think it it's a problem of the industry, to tell Absolutely. you the truth, because we have been used to be um, uh, kind of like like a black box, you know, mm -hmm. uh, usually even in budget wise, because, you, you know, who buys the SCADA? The SCADA software is bought by the by people in, in the project department mm -hmm. or in the maintenance department and the IT people who is, you know, the entity that has all the budget to keep uh, updated and to keep it uh, uh, and to keep it uh, with the latest technology. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they never see at the SCADA system because they they didn't buy it. They look at that something like really weird that you know it's part of a machine, so it's yep. not theirs. And, and that's why I always joke with, uh, about this with my customers when I walk into a, a plant and I and, and and I always check the 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 you know the 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 receptionist's uh, 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 PC or, or or the computer she has or he has. <laughs> Uh, and it's always better than the one in the plant. Always. So it doesn't make sense, you know? So it's so basic that, that both worlds, I mean, IT and OT collide because that's, that's the only way that everything that's on the, on the production floor uh, gets released. And as, uh, and as, uh, as I, I talked today before, I used the term uh, being democratized because you have invested so many so much money down on the machines, on sensors, on, on PLCs, that it's, it's kind of uh, silly that you cannot distribute that data all across the hierarchy of, the, of a company. Absolutely. No, um, I, 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 I love what you're saying, Francisco. Um, 
And I, I think I think it's time for for a bit of a funny story. It is, as Vlad mentioned in the beginning, ICC week. Francisco and I, you know, it it kind of revolves in our in our life. And so three or four years ago, Francisco and I were on the integrator panel together. And so we sat down and he he and I met the first time, and there were four or five of us. And so he and I were talking and I told him how we are very nomadic and we travel around and we can work from everywhere. And I, I see this look on his face. He's like, who is this strange person who just travels around and doesn't have to go to the office? And so Francisco and I reconnected a little over a year ago um, and we were talking and I was asking, you know, how it's going with the lockdowns. And Francisco, do, do you want to kind of like tell the story of how quickly, like from the point of uh, Ecuador had COVID to the point of you guys were transitioning into uh, into your home offices, your your new home offices, if you will. Oh yeah, sure. Well, it it was it was very sudden, like for everyone else around worldwide, I guess. Here in Ecuador, I believe I remember it was it was March the tenth mm -hmm. uh, that uh, we got the 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 warning basically that something kind of weird was happened twenty twenty. Mm -hmm. And, um, and and of course we 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 had a meeting with with the other directors in the company and we said well what do we do uh, and we said you know for for the safety of everyone here we should go home so mm -hmm. we closed the office on March uh, March the 12th actually uh, on 2020 we sent everyone home with their laptops and with their computers and uh, the thing is that you know whenever you you practice what you what you talk about mm -hmm. you should have been ready for this so we already had like a, a pretty a pretty neat uh, network uh, infrastructure within our, our offices we already had a vpn uh, uh, with our offices and with uh, with most of our most important customers like the day-by-day -day basis customers um, because they needed support the, the difference was that, you know, we were used to get connected usually at night <laughs> and usually during the weekends, but uh, it turns out to, to, to become the everyday life, basically. That was, that was the, the, main, the main difference. We were already using Teams since, uh, since uh, 2016, actually. Uh, so we were, if you ask me, I wasn't preparing for a pandemic. Actually, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the uh, strategic planning of the company, uh, when we were preparing that in 2017, mm -hmm. uh, the, the subject that actually came out, you know, uh, should we consider a pandemic? You know, the, the, the assessment guy said, and, uh, and I remember the three of us, the three partners, we, we laughed and we said, no, come on, that's never going to happen. And, 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 uh, and then, so we weren't preparing for that. We were just preparing to serve our customers in the best way. But the moment that the pandemic came, everything worked perfectly so we switched in, in two days we were working actually the most the most problem uh, tr troublesome um uh, thing for us was was not the technical people you know because all the engineers were used to do whatever from whatever uh, as, as as you always say 60 hours a week probably with no chair with, with no <laughs> table with no water but um uh, but the issue was the, the the administrative people because they 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 were the ones that were used to uh, to be at the office and have everything you know in place that was the, the most challenging thing actually but it, it, it took a while like a, a couple a, a couple of weeks but uh, it turned out well francisco i want to go back um sorry to change trajectories a little bit i like the story but I, I want to learn a little more about you know when you were getting started and i think like this will help some of our viewers who are either looking to get into automation or per perhaps like progress in their career uh, in manufacturing, but you said that you've learned a very specific skill, which was AutoCAD, right? And I think it's very important to recognize that, um, for example, for myself in engineering school, you're a lot, you're taught a lot of, I would say, um, skills that are not necessarily practical from an employer standpoint. So I'm wondering, I guess, first of all, why did you, what led you to choose AutoCAD specifically? And what advice would you give in general, like engineers who are Again, maybe focusing a lot on the theoretical, um, I would say, aspects of engineering, how to enter the field of automation manufacturing in general, based on that like perspective. Sure. Well, I think everyone's profile is very respectable. Let's start from that. So if someone is really theoretical and it's, you know, like really getting into all the math and all the physics of whatever we do in automation is also respectable because probably it's going to end up in, in a research and development 
and and discovering something, inventing something. So it's 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 pretty it's pretty good to have that also. But if you're we call it in Spanish something like uh, application engineering, what we do, you know, so I don't know if that, that, that covers, yep. in, covers it in English. Um, and, and if you want to become like, a, like an automation engineer, like, like someone that does uh, the designing and, 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 and um, uh, you know, programming and starting up and commissioning of, of control systems, I would say it's, it's rather complicated nowadays. <laughs> the only okay. advice I can say is keep learning. I mean, because, you know, we are uh, that kind of, 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 of field where you cannot stop with what they teach you in, in college, basically. Because for, as you said, they, they probably teach you. I, I always liked when I hire someone, I always like to, uh, one of the first questions that I do is, okay, how many brands of automation uh, devices you know? And, and it's really worrying for me that, you know, in, in college, I mean, you can have all the theory, as you said, but you have no clue of how to get that grounded to, to the practice. And uh, right. uh, so, um, uh, so I always ask about that. And, uh, and I, what I would, I, I always recommend to, 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 to whoever works with me, um, I always said, you have to be ready to learn. If you want to make, if you want to do automation nowadays, it's a really confusing profile because you have to be a really good uh, electronics engineer. That's obvious, obviously the base, but you also have to somehow be curious a lot, of, uh, have a lot of curiosity about IT, you know, like databases and uh, and uh, and uh, programming languages, uh, and you have you also have to have some interest in networking because you 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 won't get any machine or any sensor nowadays integrated if you don't if you if you don't uh, work with networking and uh, on top of that you have to be a people person <laughs> which is uh, one of the hardest things because uh, whenever you go to a, to a to a, a plant to a, a project basically um, you have to learn how to acquire the know-how and uh, and that's a people skill you know, you have to become the best friend with the operator, with probably with the, the production chief, because those are the guys that know how, how it runs. Not the manuals, not the procedures sometimes. If you really want to correct something, you have to go to the, to the root, uh, which is the people that, are, that, that is actually uh, making the job and, and making things happen. Uh, and uh, so if you combine all those skills, uh, you will get... Uh, like a, a really good uh, controlled engineer, basically. Especially because uh, the way the industry is going, uh, as, a, as, a, as we are speaking today about DevOps and stuff, are things that come from, from IT. Absolutely. It's not in our world, as we say. Uh, if you want to stay and remain on the OT side, probably many of the skills, probably networking is needed. Uh, but uh, but probably the, the, the rest of what I have talk, uh, talked about is not going to be required. But the problem is that, you know, uh, designing uh, uh, control panels, programming PLCs, and that kind of stuff, at least in our market here in, in South America, it's, uh, for me, it's already a commodity. Like mm -hmm. probably 10 years ago, uh, that made a difference because only few people knew how to do that. Mm -hmm. But nowadays, it's, it's not a, 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 a value-added skill mm -hmm. for a company because many people does that. Mm -hmm. What makes the difference is how you use that commodity in order to add value upstairs in the company. And, and that forces uh, not only a, a person, but also the company uh, that, that that person works for to have this weird profile uh, between IT and OT, being able to... Um, you know, the speech until two years ago, it was, you should be able to communicate both worlds. You should talk the, the OT language and the IT language. Right. I right. would go a, a, a little bit further now, two or three years after that was the speech. I would say nowadays, okay, we, uh, our role is not to be interpreters. It's not to be translators. That's part of it. Nowadays, we, we have to work with, uh, with uh, the best of, both worlds, the best from OT and bring it upstairs and the best from IT and bring it downstairs. And that's when, uh, that's where everything actually collides. That's when the, where the gap between the two worlds actually um, disappears. 
uh, if we take all the great influence from, from the IT world, because they have been uh, developing applications for as long as we have been doing control systems, right? So uh, something good they have to have on, on their side. And, and that's, you know, when, when, when you talk about waterfalls and you talk about agile uh, development, and nowadays you, you talk about uh, um, uh, um, DevOps, uh, that's something that I believe, you know, that's my personal point of view. Uh, you, we should be able to take that and bring it downstairs so we can uh, use it to solve many, many, many issues that we have uh, and we have had for many years regarding the projects we do. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, go ahead, Dave, go ahead. Oh, I was, I was going to say, absolutely. And um, again, it's it's one of those things where it's it's always interesting how forward of a thinker you and the company are, Francisco, in relation to how you like to joke that you guys are, you know, behind what we're doing in, uh, in North America, but the idea of kind of blending that IT and that OT and the finding the value at higher levels and how, even though much of the automation is newer in your, in parts of South America, that a lot of the PLC program in the other uh, the other items like that are, are fairly commoditized, right? They're fairly stable. Lots of people can do them and you continue to look to uh, to try to find value. Can you talk a little bit about some of those tools that you guys have either created or are potentially looking to implement to, to meld more of those IT strategies, more of those DevOps strategies into either ASE or into your customers? Sure. Well, well it's kind of hard to, to bring DevOps to the OT mm -hmm. floor nowadays because, because of the kind of industry we have, mm -hmm. right? Uh, the first thing that you, that you should have in order to be able to, to think about DevOps in, in, in the OT world is, is to have something that actually can work with DevOps, right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, because, you know, if, if we start with the basic thing for us, the first step, which would be source control. Right, mm -hmm. uh, you should have something that, uh, you know, some kind of platform to work with that allows that source to be controlled. <laughs> right. Yes. So it's a it's a pretty new concept in, in our industry, definitely. Uh, for example, I I don't know of any other SCADA platform that actually allows to be source controlled, and I mean by standard tools, not mm -hmm. by something like built for for it. Yeah. You know. Um, uh, than ignition in that sense. And, and, and I'm not talking like three or four versions ago. We're talking about the, the, la the latest release, the eight version of, yep. of ignition is the first one that uh, is actually prepared for us to be able to bring the DevOps algorithms down, uh, uh, down in the OT floor. Why? Absolutely. Because it exposes all the, uh, all the programming files basically to the, to the system, right? To, to the file system of the operating uh, of the OS. Uh, so that allows um, for uh, you know uh, tools uh, as wide yeah. widely spread in the in the IT world like GitHub or something like that to be able to be used as uh, as a tool for source control. So uh, what we we have been uh, uh, using for for some months already because it's brand new in in, in the industry I believe um, the GitHub uh, concept for us for source control you know versioning. Uh, and only on the SCADA floor, because uh, and only on the SCADA and only where where we use Ignition, because the platform allows you to use that kind of uh, that kind of uh, of tool. We have been using GitHub. We have been uh, we have we try we also try the Azure DevOps uh, mm -hmm. tools, which also has the the Git repository. Uh, and and you know I, I believe any tool like uh, like has been thought to be um, uh, able to deliver. This kind of, uh, of, of, of purpose should work with any platform in order for web, web uh, for DevOps to be uh, able to be delivered in, in the OT floor. A great a great dream that we have is that to have in search control down to the PLCs, mm -hmm. you know, Absolutely. because on the SCADA on the SCADA floor is or in the SCADA level is where you nowadays with platforms such as Ignition you actually can have collaboration. Mm -hmm. And that's where also search control makes more sense. If you, have, if, you, if you have a platform where you kind of are able to collaborate because you have multi-user, but not necessarily are working on the same project, or you cannot handle versioning or that kind of stuff, it doesn't make much sense. 
But if you have a platform that actually allows you to implement a, a source control tool, a, a, a generic like widespread use, um, that's the best thing that you can hope for. Because in that sense, if, if, if that same platform allows you to have three, four designers working on the same, on, on the same uh, environment and deliver uh, all the changes that you need in a platform, then it turns out to be agile, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and also uh, to bring that on, you know, for all the testing and, and simulating and then afterwards the deployment. So, but the main issue that I see on the OT floor for, for any uh, DevOps to be really widespread uh, solutions is that it, the platforms are ready for it. So, and, and, and as I said, if I take it, uh, down even more downstairs to the PLC, mm -hmm. man, that's a dream. Because mm -hmm. what happens in the projects uh, uh, or, or what, what system integrators are forced to do, we have done so for years, is to teach everyone that comes and work for us how we program. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, so you can kind of like, if you have a big project where you have uh, seven, 10, 20 PLCs, you know, if you start a, a program and, and you have to take some rest, you know, no, no one lasts a month working 60 hours a week with no table, no water in the heat, <laughs> right? Uh, so the, the, only, the only way that you can, can have like shifts, you know, between the, the programmers is that you program the same. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and that's the only tool we have had for years, right? And um, uh, I'm not gonna say that it's the worst thing because it also has uh, forced us as integrators to create a culture, right? Mm -hmm. uh, where, where we all kind of like program alike and, 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 and it also uh, involves teamwork on that. But if on top of that culture, in, in, on top of that shifting between the PLCs, you can be sure, you know, because you have source control of what you are doing as an integrator, man, that's a really useful tool. Yeah, and it's, uh, I mean, I think we all have stories where it's like multiple shifts and you have to send, you know, the programmer on second shift your latest program and then they have to hopefully get the right version, work off that on the PLC because I think tools have certainly improved, as you said, and I think we're headed in that direction, but there's still um, a couple of roadblocks like on the PLCs, HMIs, uh, to make it, I would say, more open and available, right? Definitely. I think every, everyone that's watching and pro, the three of us, I, I, I'm pretty sure that you have had like a, like a version of the program that says final PLC, right? And then, and then final V2, you scroll final down v2, on the, final on the folder, you go to the final, v2, final, yeah. and the really final, uh, yeah. you know, so it, it, it's nonsense. Uh, final and final thing. underscore and, you know, all of those good things. Exactly. Exactly, and uh, but 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 one of the the roadblocks there uh, is the kind of industry we have because mm -hmm. uh, we would have to have some sort of standard, you know, for a tool to be generic, mm -hmm. right? Uh, on the PLC side, I, I mean, and and that's that's a really I think the biggest challenge if someone wants to develop that kind of tools. Well, let me ask you this then, because this is um, I actually wanted to ask this question on the previous podcast because I think it's very relevant. But where do you see, let's say, the current PLC and HMI ecosystem heading? Right, because currently you have vendors that have developed their own software, their own hardware. It's highly proprietary. But you can also go in a different direction where you would have more of a, let's say, Linux-based, uh, you would just deploy an industrial computer, you know, throw that in your panel, and that would, again, serve up your ignition screen, serve up, like, you can technically run, like, a factory talk view AC, you know, like, local application. Like, do you see maybe the hardware and software headed more like that way, where it's more open source, more, again, because I think it provides multiple benefits, right? Like, not just being more open, but also people from the IT side, and I'm talking more, let's say software engineers would have a much easier time going into those platforms versus, you know, the more proprietary uh, PLCs that are programmed. And again, there's certainly workarounds and there's text-based languages that are closer to that, but those platforms can be programmed in Python and Java and so forth. Like, what are your thoughts on, again, this could be five, 10 years down the road. Like, how do you see, uh, that like PLC HMI, like plant floor ecosystem changing. 
that's a very tough question. I, I wish you would have done it in last postcard, so, so so I could see what 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 the other guy said and, and probably well, I, I, mind, I mean, right? I, I can uh, give like my quick two cents. You know, I really think that you know open source projects are going to get bigger and bigger, just like they've done in, in software, right? Like that's why let's say Linux and all the platforms like Ubuntu built on top of it are gaining a lot of tractions in the software industry right and so i think manufacturing is co going to kind of follow that but at the same time you know to play maybe de devil's advocate i know that there's a lot of reliability concerns when it comes to open source projects right so as soon as you for example on let's say rockwell you can program only with a very standard set of rules and if you go into a linux based platform well you can start introducing all sorts of libraries and things can i would say break or become unreliable really quickly so it's hard for me to say like exactly what's going to happen but i think we will see more let's say especially on the data application side more like pc like linux open source based uh controls but i don't know if like you know in mission critical applications they're, they're going to be used anytime soon I'm going to tell you what I, the two scenarios that I see. Uh, I, the first one is when I, what I would like to happen. And the second is what I believe it's going to happen, right? Okay. Okay. <laughs> the, what, I would like it, what I would like to happen is basically um, that uh, we end up with uh, open standards, probably not, not open, open source, right? Uh, but with open standards, in order to be able to uh, deliver solutions um, that allow the control systems industry to open up to the rest of the of the technology available across a company, right? That comes, uh, as you said, from the PLC side. You know, probably we, 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 I don't know. I'm I'm going to I'm going to be really daring in in in, in this I think, but I don't know how, for how long. We, we talked with Dave uh, these ones, I believe, and, and we agree like probably in five, 10 years, probably we won't be talking about PLCs anymore. Mm -hmm. Probably we will be talking about edge nodes, right? Edge nodes and uh, I guess the cloud controlling everything, right? Exactly, edge nodes with, with IO, basically. Yep. Uh, and uh, because in that sense, uh, we could remain uh, having reliable control, right? Uh, but also all the all the benefits of being able to deliver data as the company requires. Mm -hmm. So in the, on on the PLC side, uh, I, that's what I see. Probably uh, PLC is going to be replaced. Probably the term I don't know. And and on, on software level, uh, then uh, then again uh, because of reliability and and everything and everything else, I don't see like like open source, but I do see uh, uh, interoperable platforms that allow you to, to uh, really deliver projects that democrat, dem democratize data across the company. What I mean is, for example, if you need to, to go to the ERP level like, like SAP, right? That's one of the biggest things that you, that you hear or one of the biggest obstacles, not only from the, from the OT side, uh, also from the IT side, because development, like, like configure, configuring and, and developing the middleware for on the on the on the ERP side, it's really really expensive, right? But if you get a, a, a software that that's able to interact in a certified way, right, with the with the inner functions of the ERP, then you can actually join both worlds with no problem, right? So that's how I would like it to happen. You know, I think that these kind of platforms are going to uh, be uh, uh, are going to be uh, developed, and, and and that's the structure they they will have. But these kind of platforms are going to be delivered to the customers and to the companies that actually go uh, into digital transformation and into uh, data driven initiatives, right? Uh, that that takes me to the other to the other uh, scenario. Because you also have, as you said, being the devil's advocate, you have mm, too many infrastructure already uh, installed, mm -hmm. right? So migrating the, uh, that kind of platforms like traditional to, or, or vintage to call them somehow, right? It's going to take a lot of investment. So 
probably the, the companies that have invested in, in that kind of, uh, of infra infrastructure are, uh, are going to be kind of like uh, a little bit truncated, the, 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 the digital transformation initiatives, uh, but they will be okay with it because, uh, or forced to be okay with it. Because unfortunately to change that will probably require too much of an investment and, and too much of, um, uh, uh, of, uh, of, uh, um, of willing <laughs> uh, uh, to, to, to change. So probably both are going to, from five to 10 years from now, both the schemas are going to, to uh, remain. But I think that you know, new, new plants, new investments and, mm -hmm. and, new, and companies with, with, with vision in the future and how they want to take, um, take a return of investment on whatever they do on the, on the OT floor are going to go with, with these open standards, probably not, not open source code, but yes, open standards platforms that allow them to um, do things on the OT floor and also accomplish all the, all the neat dreams on the, on the IT side and on the production side on quality assurance and, and, and things that doesn't uh, uh, restrain anything, right? Yeah, I yeah. think that make, makes sense. I like uh, your two perspectives a lot, Dave. What are your What are your thoughts on that uh, on that point? I I think I'm going to echo uh, many of Francisco's thoughts. So you guys can probably tell that he and I spend a lot of time talking. Uh, but no, <laughs> I think I'm going to echo many, many of, of his thoughts. Maybe more on like the, the devil's advocate advocate side. I think that there are, will certainly be opportunities. I think that we are seeing a lot of upgrade cycles, especially for PLC fives that are now like 30 years too old to, to be running much of these, but I think we're seeing upgrade cycles. And I would almost wonder if with all of the supply chain issues that we're finding, it will not allow us to kind of jump from PLC upgraded to another PLC to, you know, maybe it's an edge controller. And I guess in, in my mind, I very much think of PLCs as edge controlling, right? So in, in my mind, much of it is we've had controllers at the edge at the machine level for the entirety or since, you know, 1970. So I think that there will absolutely be a lot of opportunities to potentially look at some of that. I think we might see more, you know, uh, Linux or, or, uh, or Codasys or other almost uh, PC based uh, programming uh, or control platforms. I think there are a lot of those that, that are coming out, including some of the some of the folks that have been on our show um, in earlier episodes. I think that there's a lot of opportunity for that. But I I think I am more hopeful in the next five to ten years for like an open standards like like Francisco is talking about. Uh, so earlier this year, uh, the the folks over in Europe were talking about MTP, so module type package, which is kind of that theoretical standard standards and the ability to go and say, hey, I want this from ABB and I want this from Festo and I want this from Rockwell. And if something breaks, it's built to a standard to be able to, you know, pull one out and replace it with something else. Um, at least that's the theory. I don't know how far they have gotten into like the, the overall agreements of that, or if we have a working model of this is how it's actually going to work. But for me, that kind of brings hope to more open standards. And if we do a better job standardizing on how we build things, much to Francisco's earlier points, it will kind of alleviate some of that strain of, it'll kind of alleviate some of that strain of, hey, I went to school and I know one controller when it's like you really need to know four or five controllers to be successful. If we can build two standards, then it should be easier to get more people into the industry, uh, which is absolutely an issue that we find up here in North America. I, I guess I guess that kind of brings up a question to, to you, Francisco. Do you guys find issue uh, or is it difficult to find people who are willing and or capable uh, to go work in controls or to go work in factories um, in South America and Ecuador? Uh, it's not a problem to find people that want to work in factories. Mm -hmm. The real problem is to find people that can work in factories <laughs> and actually deliver, right? Okay, yep. uh, because, you know, uh, I, I've, I've always said uh, that the integration business, it's actually a labor of love. <laughs> right uh, because you really have to be passionate about what you do it really has to uh, move you right um, because it's really uh, it's it's really a hard 
business to be in mm -hmm. because of the scheduling, because of uh, uh, because of the, the the working situations, you know, within a plant and stuff. So uh, it's not that hard to find it, as as I said. But uh, it's um, it's really hard uh, to find people that um, uh, that lasts in the in the in the job. Yeah, and 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 that's that's really bad for integration business at, at this point because. I don't know if that happens in, in, in North America, but here in, the, in, in South America, what happens is that uh, you don't have any working uh, uh, engineers like out there ready mm -hmm. to be productive from minute one. You always have to do training, right? Uh, and, and you have to do a lot of training. Usually for us, for example, uh, we, hire, we, we are used just in very seldom situations, we have hired like people with experience. We rather hire uh, people right from college mm -hmm. because it. Uh, we even changed the, the the mission of our company to uh, you know uh, to uh, create uh, human resources. You know, like human talent, uh, in order to deliver good projects. That that's a why is that? Why why don't you like uh, you know experienced you know, because, professionals? Yeah, uh, no, no. I mean because usually. Well, what uh, uh, what any integrator has on their mission is I want to deliver the best systems ever, right? <laughs> or something like that. In our, in our case, our mission is to create the people uh, able to deliver that those kind of systems. Because as I said, you know, usually when you hire, uh, uh, whether it's some someone uh, recently graduated or you or you hire someone with uh, some years of experience in the in the in the control business, uh, they will they will know exactly what a control engineer is expected to do. The problem is that our industry requires much more, many more skills than that nowadays. So yeah. the, uh, from the day one, when I hire someone, probably it's going to become productive. Uh, I expect in, in, in five to six months uh, time lapse, right? Uh, because why? Because you have to start with, well, first on the products, the control products you, 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 you use as an integrator whether you're in Siemens, in Rockwell, in Schneider, or whatever you use, um, you, uh, you know, you have to give training on that. And mm -hmm. second, uh, if you're uh, an integrator that wants to fill the gap between IT and OT, you have to start with a lot of training on databases, on networking, uh, and, um, and, and from the basic concepts. Because unfortunately, you cannot ask a controls professional to know that. Mm -hmm. That's not part of our profile nevertheless is something that's needed right yeah, yeah. And what are your thoughts like to to that point i i like the way like you you phrased it right so coming back to and again we've asked this question several times and i'm still trying to like figure out the answer but going from software engineering right someone who really knows software well and making them your like data or automation expert. And again, maybe the gaps will be different, but perhaps I think now, as you've kind of mentioned it, there's not as much need for them to know the hardware and they do have like the software components, right? Someone who comes again with software engineering would probably know databases, would know all the DevOps tools, would know, um, you know, again, like you're not gonna have to teach them Python, Java, uh, C, C++, whatever. Like, what are your thoughts on that versus like taking an electrical engineer? Okay, I'm gonna tell you. Uh, I'm gonna tell you a story, right? <laughs> Rather yep. than answering the question. I like that. I like that. Uh, we have, you know, we have been in the market for 17 years, and uh, I, I'm not saying it's impossible, but whenever we have done the the experiment of hiring IT people to do OT, like control systems uh, work with the training in the middle and everything. It doesn't turn out as well as if you take someone from, uh, from like an electronic engineer and take it and take him to the to the IT level. Why? Because uh, I think um, part of the of the of the automation uh, engineer or the controls engineer, whether you want it, you like it or not, uh, it, it has to do with programming. So you have you have some sort of of uh, programming levels, right? Uh, and programming skills. Uh, the the problem with the, the with people that comes from the IT world is that you don't have all the all the electronics and all you know like electricity and all the mechanical design uh, background. And it's harder to 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 pick on, on on those skills or teach those skills to someone that comes from IT 
than teaching IT to someone that already has all the physical, mechanical, all the process know-how. Uh, so we have discovered that it's easier because we have tried it <laughs> both ways, like hiring people from IT and hiring people from OT. Uh, I'm not going to generalize. I'm not going, I'm, I'm not going to say it's impossible because it, it's not like that, but it's easier for a, uh, from our exper experience for a controls engineer to go to take the step up to, to learn all the IT uh, world things than the opposite. At, at least that's that's uh, that's uh, my experience on that. Gotcha. Yeah. That, that is that is amazing. And uh, to take a pause, I'm going to ask Vlad to give me the awkward laugh he gives before I get before I do every ad read. So Vlad, <laughs> if you can give us the sound effect, thank you. Now, now, Francisco, th this may or may not solve a problem that you were talking about earlier um, of our sponsor. And I promise that we did not set this up, uh, but uh, we, we can give you some more information when we get off the show. So this episode and the theme is brought to us by Copia Automation, and they deliver modern developer tools for industrial automation. So it's built for automation and controls engineers. And Copia's flagship offering provides Git-based source control for PLC programming. Uh, if you guys are wondering, they're currently on the Rockwell, Alan Bradley, the Siemens, and the Codasys platforms. So functionality includes version control, change visibility, and the collaborative design, again, as Francisco was talking about, to streamline how industrial machines are commissioned and operated, resulting in much faster delivery and maximized uptime. Um, and if you guys are interesting, they are offering a free trial. And if you guys check the comments or if you're listening via podcast, you guys can check the show notes. You guys can go ahead and click through there. If they ask, let them know that uh, the Dave and Vlad sent you. And, uh, and again, thank you to, uh, to Copia Automation for continuing to, uh, to support the show. Absolutely. Thanks, Dave. No, oh, perfect. And so I think that you bring up many good points, Francisco. And so for everyone that doesn't know, Francisco and I normally spend the first 90 minutes of our 30, 60 minute conversation talking about things that aren't work. And then we remember that we, we are getting close on time. But as we are getting close on time, I do have a couple of, I actually have three questions to, uh, to ask you. Now for everyone that doesn't know, Francisco has something in common with Leonardo DiCaprio. Um, for, uh, and so, so Francisco has for five out of the last six years been a finalist, but not a winner, uh, for the ICC, the ignition community conference discover gallery, which is, which is the award show Francisco as Vlad and I don't have anything in common with Leo. Can you tell us what that feels like? Um, well, it doesn't feel right. <laughs> but on the other hand, we're, we're, we're turning it around and saying, yeah, you know, like being there once, it's mm -hmm. kind of like, okay, being, being there twice is great. Mm -hmm. But being five times, it, the only thing that proves is that we deliver every time, right? Oh, absolutely. So, so it, it's, it's harder to remain than to get there, they say, right? At least in Spanish, we have a saying that that's something like that uh so no no I, I would say that it's it's very impressive the fact that you guys have done it so many times in five out of six years you can you continue to deliver deliver high value projects to your end users um i, I think is, is is nothing short of i think it's nothing short of amazing yeah and the, and the great thing and, and i'm really proud of the of, of the team that i have is that we have been on the on, on these kind of uh, uh, awards since 2016, basically. Mm -hmm. And the good thing is that every time is a different member of the staff, you know? It's not like we have like only one, one good engineer to tell you to, to, to say it somehow, but it's rather every time one of the guys and one of the, or one of the uh, engineers surprises. And we are, we are very, very proud of actually three things. Uh, first, the first one is that we remain on the, on the on the list every year which is really good the second is that we're really proud that we are one of the few uh, companies from south america and latin america in general that have been on, the, on that list uh, and third is that we are really proud also that uh, i think two or three years out of the five that we have been are projects that were uh, uh, coordinated and, and and senior engineered by women uh, because uh, yeah, I, I was checking the other day some webinar about women in automation, mm -hmm. and and it was mostly uh, people in the sales area, and uh, there's nothing wrong with that. But 
there's also many many women uh, involved in the in the operational uh, technology on, on the development that it's it's really something that we are really happy about Oh, absolutely. And so j just a little shout out to ASC. I know Francisco and I have talked. He says that half of his engineering staff are, are, are men and the other half are women, uh, which is, as he and I have talked about, significantly higher percentages. The even percentage is nearly unheard of um, for most companies or every company that I know. In, it's uh, it's on, the, on the coordinating floor uh, uh, of the company. On the execution, we're working on that. We are, we are about one third, but we are... Okay. We are we're permanently working on that. No, I, I, absolutely. I think it's I think it's amazing that you guys have found uh, you, such a diverse group who have come together, who continue to uh, deliver the, the high value projects that you guys continue to, we'll call it win awards or come very close to, to winning the whole thing. <laughs> to almost win an award. <laughs> to to al almost win. I, I keep saying, I, I think that we should, uh, we should start a, a petition that Francisco and ASC either get some sort of lifetime achievement award next year, or we name the, the runner up the, the if, uh, we name the runner up for Francisco. So like the Francisco Carrion, uh, almost we almost made it. Better luck next year, Discover Gallery <laughs> finalist award. It, it's a little long, but I think it'll get the I think it'll get the point across. Yeah. But no, let's go uh, speakers. It get catch. Absolutely. But uh, as as that came out yesterday, absolutely want to uh, to wish a congratulations to the whole team. A couple of uh, wrap up questions that we ask everyone, Francisco, I like to call this the not sponsored audible segment is where we go and ask if you have a good book or a good document that uh, that you would suggest everyone, uh, everyone reads. Sure. Well, I, 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 I don't have a book that I would like to recommend but rather something that I, every time that I hire someone in the, in, in the company, or if I talk to someone that really wants to easily understand, because, you know, the, the IIoT terms, mm -hmm. industry for uh, digital transformation, my God, everyone uses it <laughs> nowadays. And it's, you know, it drives me crazy because half of them have no idea what exactly it, 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 it actually mm -hmm. Uh, means right yep. so uh, whenever I, I i hire someone i, I recommend a, a conference from andy stanford clark uh mm -hmm. which took place right after the icc i think it was two or three years ago um it wasn't like a technical um approach because it wasn't within the icc it was just a conference for the people in Folsom, which is the city where inductive automation is i had the luck to be there uh and uh, and it really uh I think it's it, it it's invaluable, you know, because he he uh, he makes a really fun, uh, entertaining hour about talking about really nerdy IIoT things, <laughs> and uh, and make them really um, really easy to understand for everyone. So uh, um, uh, it, it's online on, on Inductive Automation's website. I think just to confirm, it's uh, Andy Stanford Clark, right, the CTO for IBM UK. Um, IBM, yeah. yeah. Okay, gotcha. So, I so got he the, is the he is the, the co-inventor of of MQTT. Of MQTT, yeah. So and and so I, I rather recommend that rather than a book. It, it's going to take only one hour of of anyone lives, anyone's life. I mean, and and uh, you will come out with either with smile. Uh, or and a smile and a bit more of knowledge about IIoT. I love that. And so I, I dropped that in the, the LinkedIn chat. Um, maybe I tried to drop it in the LinkedIn chat. I don't I know. dropped it there as well. Okay. Well, it, it's not letting me post on my own post. So, um, <laughs> so Vlad has dropped it there and we will absolutely keep that in the show notes. No, I, I appreciate that Francisco. I think everyone who has seen that uh, also absolutely appreciate uh, Andy's talk. And then the, the last question I have you I have for you is is who should reach out to you guys? I imagine everyone in South America looking for some sort of automation project, but uh, but but who beyond that? Who should reach out to you, uh, to you guys at ASC? Uh, well, basically the the easy answer to that is everyone. I mean, <laughs> uh, we we work with of course end customers. We work also with with other system integrators that need uh, uh, somehow uh, our knowledge on 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 their side. Uh, we we believe a lot on on community on community basically uh, because no one knows it all so 
uh, if there's a project that requires our services, whether it's an end customer, whether it's a, a, another system integrator, we are always happy to help. Uh, on the other hand, if someone wants to learn Ignition, for example, we are a, a premier integrator. Um, we, are, we are also an integrator for Rockwell Automation, for Wonderware, and for Siemens, uh, the three of them in, in, the, in the top categories on, uh, that each brand manages. Um, but we are also a CTC, a certified training center for Ignition. So if anyone want, has the need to learn um, the software, uh, the only catch is that the, we are the only CTC in the world that's allowed at the moment, or not allowed, that at the moment are teaching Ignition in Espanol. <laughs> so that's the only catch. If you want to learn Ignition in Spanish, contact us. We, uh, with the pandemic, we are doing it remotely. Uh, so That was going to be my have... question. So like there's yeah. an opportunity to learn it remotely. That's awesome. Sure. You, you, you don't even have to come to Ecuador. We used to have like many people like before the pandemic come here, learn Ignition and go to the Galapagos Islands, uh, which was a, a pretty neat uh, thing to do but nowadays we can do it remotely and uh, and uh, so anyone can reach us we are always happy to help we are always uh, uh, happy to have this kind of chat with 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 anyone that needs to share some uh, some experiences or or wants uh, our experiences to be shared so no, awesome perfect. thank you so much francisco really appreciate your time yes thank thank you so much uh, go ahead Dave, no, thank go you ahead. for having me Thank you. No, no, perfect. No, I was going to say uh, thank, thank you to Francisco. Thank you for everyone um, who, thank you for everyone for listening. As again, if you guys are listening to us on the podcast or anywhere else, please remember to hit that like button and give us five stars on Apple Podcasts because that apparently, uh, that apparently uh, matters. But subscribe to the channel. We will have, uh, we'll have new episodes coming out every Thursday and we will be live here every Wednesday. Thank you to Francisco. Thank you to everyone else. And until next week, we'll see you guys soon. Thank Bye. you, everyone. Thank you. Take care. Have a great one.